When did you notice it went off? Just now? Okay, so maybe somebody bumped it on the way out. We'll see. We're starting. Okay. So basically, this is part two. The phone went off. The so we're dealing in two segments, and I'll, I'll put them together. Um, so one of the things here is that he, the, the terms here, unlocking, transforming, storing, distributing, switching, are all terms that he associates with the modern understanding of inframing as a way of revealing. Um, and its application in terms of a specific, of a specific technology, a hydroelectric plant, mechanized agriculture. Um, in the bigger lecture, so this is based on a previous on a lecture he did, part of the Freiburg lectures, where he also compares concentration camps to mechanized agriculture in terms of the technology used. Yeah, Chris. You were saying it's never fully revealed. Yeah, yeah. I would say so, yes. And so what's being revealed in the technology we use is different than what was revealed in the technology building to it. I mean, I think once we get to algorithms, it gets really interesting. Because, um, first of all, because they were so claimed to be neutral. And then very quickly, one found out that they weren't neutral, that they actually reproduced the sexism and racism and inequalities in the society in which they were made because they were programmed in and then they took on their own sort of machine learning, right? So so I think I think that's a really good example. And the standing reserve, I mean humans, if you think about like humans, I mean we're standing reserves uh, both for technology and for labor. You know, it's kind of like um, if you take a look at, at casual labor or you know there's a van in Kensington Market that comes around and picks up day labor. And they're kind of standing reserve. Um, there, there's people who don't have jobs who are doing day labor, who labor so they can eat, who are probably not um, having the best, first of all, they won't get the best jobs. Secondly, I think they get paid in cash, which is good. But thirdly, probably the safety conditions are not all that great. Mm -hmm. So they're a standing reserve of um, labor. And it, it, he would argue, if he used the term capitalism, which he doesn't, but he would, but he would argue modern technology, um, which is the technology of the war technology, my is going to talk about that, corporate technology, that, that basically it functions on a standing reserve. That, it, that we have stored up technological knowledge, all of it done in terms of um, the way of ordering the world, which is an instrumental way, which is, is basically the inframing of the modern world. So then he talks about the forester, and this is from page 18, to, to um, illustrate the standing reserve. Um, the forester, so you got like, you know, some, some good images there of foresting. Uh, the forester, who in the wood? Woods. Measures the felled timber into all appearances, walks the same forest path in the same way as did his grandfather, is totally commanded by profit making in the lumber industry, whether he knows it or not. He's made subordinate to the orderability of cellulose, which for its part is challenged forth. Now, the distinction there between bringing forth and challenging forth. So, so the person who's chopping down timber is bringing forth. Um, he's, he, for, which for its part is challenged forth by the need for paper, which is then delivered to newspapers and illustrated magazines. And we're thinking, hmm, that doesn't apply so much anymore, so what's the wood being used for now? Also building, um, I'm sure you can think of other, other things. The latter, in their set configuration of opinion, becomes available on demand. So he's referring to the newspapers and excuse me, magazines there. Now, one of the things that's happened with forestry, as we know, is the land has just been destroyed. If you take a look at the bottom, the bottom picture, um, because once you get mechanized, once you get mechanized lumbering, um, and of course, then after, you get tree planting. Okay, so they are, they are replacing them. But, but you've got, you never quite keep up with, with the lumbering, it's, with the cutting the trees down itself. 
And it's a multi-million dollar industry. Uh, my cousins actually uh, have a forestry company in northern BC. They totally love it. And they can talk endlessly about um, like their equipment, because their equipment is like mega bucks, and, and we're talking millions. Um, and you know, it's sort of like, man, if you can afford to buy that equipment, like why are you not just, I don't know, using the money. Um, but they, they're really into it. And I mean, uh, what's interesting, because they're also into like roping and riding and like all that, right? It goes, kind of goes with it, so it's kind of cool. But, but it's really interesting. So the distinction he's making there is, I mean, Heidegger didn't foresee even, or maybe he foresaw, but he never saw the extent to which lumbering has been uh, mechanized and is a corporate mega million dollar industry, right? So this, so what's interesting about this book, 1950, um, what's interesting is he's he's kind of on the cusp of atomic energy blowing up. He's seen uranium there become used in atomic energy in a particular war in framing. Uh, hydroelectricity has has become extremely mechanized, um, and so he's kind of seeing all that and he's reacting from a position of a previous time. I mean, this is is very much a position of the previous time. Now, standing reserve, um, Bestand in German, it's basically stock stockpiling. It's elements that can be used. It's based on instrument, instrumentality. And what this leads Heidegger to say that the modern world, basically, the technology of the modern world, the modern technology, sees the world as a standing reserve, including the humans living in it. So then you think, hmm, that's interesting. Um, the problem with Heidegger is he never makes a, he, he observes this, but he never points, and he observes that it's wrong in terms of human potential, but he never sort of takes it into the economic and political realm, really, where he talks about the fact that the third and fourth world is and what's now known as the Global South really has become has become a standing reserve labor market. Um, so it, it's both humans and it's all the materials. And if you go back to Fionn, the whole so the, the raw materials in um, Africa and the Caribbean and Asia became a standing reserve for European powers and for American powers. Is still running okay, Sandra? Yeah, great. Okay, I think somebody bumped it. That's probably what happened when they were leaving. So humans are the, if you go to page 27, this is on 27, humans are the orderers of the standing reserve. They're the orders of the standing reserve. We've ordered all of this. We're the orders. Actually, page 27 is really important in terms of, um, of how he sets up the standing reserve. He says that, that we're the orders of the standing reserve, and everywhere, uh, humans everywhere always encounter only themselves when they're encountering the technology. That it's a destiny. That, that as a destiny, it vanishes, the it vanishes humans into that kind of revealing, which is an ordering. That, that we are the ordering or the orders of the standing reserve. And we're ourselves, we're the standing reserve. We pose as control. We pose to go back to Hegel as lords of the earth. However, the animating impulse of technology and framing as it manifests in the, in the modern world is that it orders both the human and the world as a standing reserve. And it does this because our approach to the technology is a challenging force. So if you go to page 17, or actually, with my note to read, slide 17. So if you take a look, 
And some of it, I think, is on, it's on page 20 and 23. So in framing in German is Gestell. And, and Heidegger often brings it, uh, the root words of it's GE uh, hyphen cell we use. That's a frame, it's an apparatus, it's a skeleton that in the framing then is the human orientation toward technology. It's the, this essence of technology. And what that means is it's the gathering together of that, the, this, when I read this, we'll go back to it. The gathering together of that setting upon which sets upon man, challenges him forth to reveal the real in the mode of ordering as a standing reserve. And you go, what? Partly that's a translation. Uh, it's when you're translating English into German, even if you're trying to make it flow nicely. But what he's saying there is this in framing is a way of gathering together. Um, and that way of gathering together is it's basically challenging forth. And what gets revealed then is this mode of ordering. And it gets revealed in the standing reserve as we're stockpiling. So in framing on page 20 is the way of revealing which holds sway in the essence of modern technology. He repeats that and repeats it. And the rule of inframing demands that nature be orderable as a standing reserve. And we've done that. We've depleted nature as a standing reserve. Then we moved on to, to go back to Fanon, we moved on to the other continents and depleted them to the uh, global subcontinents and depleted them as a standing reserve. And then what happens, the question then becomes, and Heidegger didn't have to face this, the question then becomes, you miss the high school students. They were awesome. Um, they, he doesn't have to answer this, but what happens then when the whole world is a standing reserve and you know, imperialism and neo-imperialism have actually determined who controls the standing reserve. Now to go back to this that we just took apart, it's on page 24. In framing is the gathering together, that's the bringing together that belongs to, he says setting upon, but it belongs to, uh, to bringing humans um, in a position to reveal the real in a mode of ordering, and that mode of ordering is in framing, and the mode of ordering is directed by accumu accumulation. Okay? You know, if you were a Marxist, you'd say, hmm, standing reserve sounds a lot like accumulation and hoarding. Um, so, I would, you could put those in just to, just to kind of understand what he's saying. As the one who's challenged forth in this way, the human stands within the essential realm of its framing, that we are not separate from it. And then Marcuse next week is going to pick up on this, and he's going to bring Heidegger and Marx together. Um, and it's not, in, in this particular essay, it's not that much of a step. I would actually say Heidegger is influenced by Marx here. So in framing, as we said before, refers to, in, in modern technology, challenging forth. It's an ordering of destiny. Whereas poesis, to go back to the person chopping wood or the, the peasant or the farmer, is, is a bringing forth. But it's also a destiny. It's just a different type of destiny. I'm not going to repeat that one again. I'm just going to go through the gathering again, but I think we've got the gathering. You know what the gathering, I mean, you get the gathering, oh, I'm sorry, you get the gathering slide, right? This idea of it's bringing together and it brings together in a certain way, and in bringing together in this certain way, it, the, the human component is brought together in the same way of ordering, and that way of ordering is what drives modern technology, and it's a drive to a standing reserve and this attempt to order and control that drives modern technology, which we would say is not much different from the accumulative principle of capitalism. Um, and that those, so you can see how Marx's um, theory of alienation comes into play there, right? You can kind of, or at least for me it does, you can kind of see that if you're doing the ordering and you're ordered in the same way you're doing the ordering, it's kind of, it's kind of a, one of the four features of alienation. In framing, you know, 
one again to get that one. Okay, so Heidegger says that's a young Heidegger. It might be worth seeing the old Heidegger thinking. And that's, you know, that's 50s and later, okay? And he definitely should be thinking there, and that's a young Heidegger. Um, the question concerning technology is the question concerning the constellation in which revealing and concealing, in which the coming to presence of truth comes to pass. Hey, hi. Um, so the, uh, the question concerning technology is this question concerning the constellation in which revealing and concealing, in which the coming to presence of truth comes to pass. So it's how it's revealed, how it's concealed, how truth is brought about. And there's two ways, of course, the truth is brought about for Heidegger. It's what he starts out with. There's in framing and poesis. There's the danger aspect of, of uh, technology that's based on challenging forth. And there is the aesthetic aspect of technology, the poesis, that's based on bringing forth. That isn't just done in art, but is done in all acts of creativity. And you could probably say, OK, well, poesis initially directs in framing, and yet. But then in framing, but then in framing takes over and that particular ordering uh, sort of carries forth. But the, you know, when you're thinking of the ordering, or when you think there's a lot of creativity there, which is poesis, but go back to the chalice and it's the end cause, what it's used for. So the idea that the sort of the purpose and the goal, if the purpose and goal is stockpiling, you're going to be working within framing, even though the development of the technology itself could have been done as, as poesis. Let's see, I think we need to get one slide ahead there, yes. Um, and framing isn't technological. It's nothing technological, it's nothing on the order of a machine. It's this way in which the, the real, and by real he doesn't mean Lacanian real, um, it's a way in which the world, the modern world, reveals itself as a standing reserve. The human is within, and it stands within the realm of enframing, and we relate to each other as those who challenge forth. And we relate to each other in terms of challenging forth, in terms of a particular type of destiny, which is the destiny that Marx talks about, I would say, in alienation. So what we have, or what do we have then in framing, is this mode of revealing a truth, or althea, which challenges forth. It takes human beings and it relegates them to ordering to instrumentality in terms of the work they do, in terms of the, the products they make, in terms of the end goal of the product, um, and in terms of the relation to one another. So if we go back to the chalice, which is a fair way it's back, yeah. If we go back to the chalice, this chalice could be made, if it's made by a craftsperson, which is what he had in mind there, um, the, type, the type of destiny would be um, a poesis. But if it's made, if it's mass produced, then even though it's for the same purpose, the type of destiny would be what he would call in framing. Okay. What in framing conceals is revealing as poesis. Now there's Heidegger, okay, so this is a good juxtaposition. This is a very old Heidegger in the Black Forest. Um, in his, uh, he had a hut, it's, called, it's now known as Heidegger's Hut. There's a book called Heidegger's Hut. Um, so this is Heidegger drawing water for his daily consumption, for his own use. And if you juxtapose this, this or juxtapose this to the hydroelectric dams, that he's talking about in terms of inframing, you kind of get an idea of where Heidegger is in the world. And you also get an idea of how he understands technology. You know, now Heidegger was no, um, you know, he would walk like 22 miles a day out in the forest. Like he was, 
you know, he was pretty fit, which allowed him to be able to do this. Um, but the more original revealing is poesis. That comes first, Heidegger says. That's original, and then the poesis, much in the way I, I talked about it, becomes, you, you've developed it, you've designed it, it becomes mass produced, it becomes an ordering, it becomes a different destiny, and that destiny is in framing, and then you just keep producing it. So the more original revealing is poesis, which lets presence come forth into appearance. That's on page 27. And I'll be done by one, so we've only got a few people presenting, so we're fine. Now he says, the threat of technology is deeper than the lethal machines. And there he's thinking of the war machines, he's thinking of the atomic, atomic bomb, he's thinking of the planes that dropped it, I would say. But the threat of technology is deeper than the lethal machines and apparatuses of technology. These are bad. But the real danger for Heidegger as a thinker is that humans are denied the possibility to enter into a more original revealing. And thus a more primal truth than that of inframing. And this more original revealing is poesis. That is, to go back to the very beginning, uh, when I talked about, or when we talked about uh, the second slide there, this is for people that have come in a little bit late, um, when he says there's two, tech, there's two conflicting tendencies in technology. There's the dominant tendency, which is the instrumental one, which is the danger inherent in technology, which becomes the inframing um, in corporate techno-scientific and techno-war economies, and there's the second, which is this tendency towards poesis. That's the saving potential inherent in technology. And he says that poesis, page 27, that poesis is more originary. That first there was poesis, and then it developed with the modern world and modern technology. And remember, Heidegger is not really all that modern. That it then developed into a framing. The more original revealing is poesis. This is technolo technology saving power. He says something that comes very close to Marx. And it comes very close to Marx, especially when you read Marcuse on technology that brings Heidegger and Marx together, which we're doing next week. He says, so long as we represent technology as an instrument, we remain held fast in its will to master. Yeah, and by the way, Hegel has influenced Heidegger quite a bit. There's some, he, has, he has Hegel lectures. And so this idea, so long as we represent technology as an instrument, we remain held fast in its will to master where we are not recognized by it, an addict, where we are not recognized by it, but we are controlled by that which we produced as a standing reserve. So it, everything we produce and us become standing reserves. That's just another um, another edition of the same essay. The question concerning technology, this is at the end, the second last page, uh, the last page is 34. The question concerning, I think it's 34, yeah. The question concerning, it should be concerning, not concerning, technology, is the question concerning the constellation in which revealing and concealing in which the coming to presence of truth comes to pass. That's how does the coming to, to uh, presence of truth come about? How, how do we understand the world? How do we, how do we create the world? How in turn are we created by it? He says human activity can never directly counter this danger of technology. And human achievement can never banish it. Then he goes to where he began. And he says, but human reflection can. And if you go to page um, 18, there's something on 18 that's really, that I discovered when I reread this, that is really, I think, important. It's at the bottom of 18, and he says, he's talking about revealing, and then he goes down to the last two lines, and he says, okay, whenever humans open their eyes and ears, unlock their heart, give themselves over to meditating and striving, striving is always important. 
shaping and working, entreating and fainting, because he also sees fainting as thinking. He finds himself everywhere, already brought into the unconcealed. The unconcealment of the unconcealed has already come to pass whenever it calls humans forth into the modes of revealing allotted to them. So that that's part of reflection, that that particular, if, if you're engaged in, in all of these activities, it's a particular way of unconcealing. And that's part of human reflection. He says human achievement can never banish um, the danger inherent in technology, but human reflection can. And if you go to the very, if you go to the very sort of beginning of the book and this third slide about the way, that's what he's connecting there. I mean, Heidegger's kind of subtle. So he's connecting is the question that um, he, he questions building, questioning builds a way, he says. And we have to pay attention, heed to the way. The way then is a way of thinking. And this way of thinking is critical reflection. And, and Mercus is going to pick up on critical reflection. And of course, last week, Zizak talked about like thinking and reflecting. So the human reflection can. Because the essence of technology is nothing technological, this is he's ending with this. Um, essential reflection, the last page is 35, sorry. Essential reflection upon technology and decisive confrontation with it must happen in a realm that is on the one hand like the essence of technology, but on the other hand, fundamentally different from it. So when he comes up with out of the blue, but it's not really out of the blue, because he's talking about poesis, he says, such a, such a realm is art. He says, such a realm is art because poetically humans dwell upon the earth. Then he ends, he ends, the, he ends with what he begins with. He ends and he says, his very last sentence, he says, Questioning is the piety of thought. We have to question, and you think to yourself when you read that, there's a certain anger there, you go, well, if questioning is the piety of thought, how, how is it that you didn't question the political regime around you? Right? It's just kind of like, because he, he says it again and again, and then you think, okay, well, he withdrew from the rectorship, but he didn't quit the Nazi party because he was scared, because he was kind of a coward, I guess. I'm not going to answer that. Yeah, Chris. Yes, and particularly when it goes back to being in time and the whole Vogue thing. So yeah, he did. But it, it's really problematic because it's a personal error that then I think, like, that then you go, okay, questioning is the piety of thought, all right? Yes, he's right. And yes, he's right on the way, and questioning is the way, and understanding what technology has done to us but he couldn't live up to his theory. Now, he's not going to be the first theorist who can't live up to their theory. Um, and I mean, I think you could judge theorists on whether they can live up to their theory or not. But yes, that, the cognitive dissonance there is, is, is important, I think. So then we get to, we get to art. Now, let me tell you that what um, Heidegger has in mind to art is Holderman's poetry, where he talks about the rhyme. And he also has, um, you know, the, the peasant shoes, right? So he has Van Gogh's peasant shoes. And he says, you know, art is, is the highest form of technique. That is a bringing forth, and it's a distinctive way in which truth comes into being, that it becomes historical. That's from his word, essay on art. Um, and of course, poesis is an art of technology. That gets expressed in language, poetry, for him. And then you could add the visual arts, speed writing, graffiti, and studies of digital media for us. And of course, as I said, the art he has in mind is Van Gogh's um, Peasant Shoes and Holderman's Poetry. Now, what he says in 
his discussion of Van Gogh's uh, peasant shoes in the origin of the work of art, he says something very interesting, and which fits very well with this theory. He says that he selected Van Gogh's peasant's shoes because the shoes, and there's a, a picture of them, reveal the whole world of life of a rural peasant woman. Um, so Heidegger is selected for that reason. The worn shoes reveal the labor and joy of a woman's life. They reveal her anxiety and show how she belongs to the earth. And Holderlin's poetry, of course, reveals truth to the German people of their historical uh, situation. And if you go to page 34, it's Holderlin's poetry that Heidegger uses to set out the two tendencies of technology. That becomes really interesting. You know, so he quotes then um, Holderlin at the end. He uses Holderlin also, he quotes his writing on the Rhine. But he quotes Holderlin at the end of 34, uh, where he says, but where danger is, grows also the saving power, the poesis. And then he says, poetically, dwells man upon the earth. Now, I wanted to go back one, but that's okay. But he says, poetically, um, draws humans upon the earth. And I think his tech, where, where his technology, his essay on technology gets you, um, becomes really interesting because it brings together his two later theories on technology, or two later works and concentrations on technology and on aesthetics. And we're finished there. Um, let's take, come back in a quarter after, we've got three people presenting. Wow, I can't turn that off now. That's amazing.